This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk a little bit about why DeFi is a lie, why decentralized finance is really a joke. Now, the people who push DeFi with their crazy whiteboards, whether it's Vitalik Buterin or even someone like Charles Hoskinson, when I see their, their whiteboards, what I see is this. I see crazy person, very smart person, trying to obf obfuscate. So what I'm going to do here is, is make a very simple critique that I don't think either Vitalik or Hoskinson would be able to answer. And this really is really done in the spirit of someone like Hans Christian Andersen, wonderful short story writer from Denmark. I really consider to be Denmark's finest philosopher. And he has a story about the emperor who has no clothes, where all the, all the adults see the emperor's new clothing, but in fact, the tailor has cheated the king and the king's walking around naked. And it's only the little boy who hasn't been so brainwashed that he can say that the emperor actually has no clothes. This is the emperor has no clothes version of DeFi. You cannot build a new decentralized financial system on top of a centralized base layer, whether that base layer is Ethereum, where most of DeFi is currently being built, or something like Cardano. You cannot build DeFi on top of CeFi. Now, Ethereum, we've talked about this many times, but just to review, Ethereum is not decentralized. It's a very scammy coin that had a huge pre-mine, pre-sale, where insiders were given huge amounts. And those, those very same insiders will benefit from the move to proof of stake, as they can just stake their coins and continue to do nothing and earn money. Ethereum is run by a centralized leader, as we've said, Vitalik Buterin, who has this bully pulpit to control Ethereum's forward path. People pretend that there's this democracy among the develop developers, but it really is Vitalik leading the charge. He's the public figurehead and he has the bully pulpit. He's also someone who has a history of having done rollbacks, for example, in 2016, when he reversed some Ethereum transactions. So this shows you the power of a crypto dictator. It also shows you when you have a centralized leader that there is a centralized point of failure. And we're going to talk about that at the end. That's one of the most dangerous things about building DeFi on something like Ethereum. Also, Ethereum has done one hard fork after another. A hard fork is just a software update that's not backwards compatible. And so it really does drag everyone along with it. Whereas with Bitcoin, you could be Rip Van Winkle. You could store your Bitcoin, go to sleep, wake up, uh, let's call it 10 or 11 years later since the uh, founding of Bitcoin, and your Bitcoin would still work fine. You'd be able to move it. With Ethereum, you can never sleep because these hard forks, you're basically forced to go along with them. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I'd encourage you to hit that subscribe and like button. Maybe share the video with a few friends, especially if they've been bewitched by Cardano or Ethereum. This is the famous case where Ethereum, under Vitalik's decision, decided to reverse, uh, reverse a transaction on the blockchain or a series of transactions to stop this attack. Now, it's wonderful to stop an attack of scammers, but you really do compromise the integrity of the blockchain when people see that you have a history of just rolling back things and reversing transactions that you don't like. As I said, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum does one hard fork after another. The way Bitcoin upgrades is through soft forks. And again, you could be Rip Van Winkle, fall asleep, and not have to worry about uh, what happens with Bitcoin. Whereas Ethereum, you really have to stay up on the calendar because it's really one hard fork after another. It's very difficult to do a hard fork when you don't have a centralized leader like uh, like Ethereum does. We've talked about this before, but it bears, um, it's it's worth saying that, Bit that Ethereum is highly, highly dependent on Infura, which is a, uh, a corporation and they provide a lot of the, um, the infrastructure and backbone for, uh, for Ethereum. Infura itself is built on top of AWS, Amazon Web Services. So it's really centralization on top of centralization. And when Infura goes down, there are major, major problems that happen with the Ethereum network. You can imagine that if, uh, if the government, let's say the U.S. government, got tired of people trading in DeFi, trading assets without having to go through KYC, which is uh, know, your, know your customer, which all brokerages have to put you through, 
what if the government decides to pull the plug on this? They decide that this is bypassing the current system. How do they do that? They just make two phone calls. They make one phone call to Infura. They make another phone call to Amazon and Ethereum will be completely crippled. So not only does the government have a way of doing this, they would have a very plausible motive to do it as well, to shut down, uh, to shut down DeFi. This has been the critique of Bitcoin. I've been getting comments like this for a very long period of time that Bitcoin is centralized in China, all the miners are there, and China controls Bitcoin. Fortunately, that's a big oops moment. That critique just went away now that China has essentially banned Bitcoin and thrown out all the miners, or in the process of throwing out all the Bitcoin miners. So if you thought that was Bitcoin's version of centralization, you can't use that particular FUD anymore. Further, Ethereum's move from one consensus mechanism to another, from proof of work, which it currently uses to proof of stake sometime later this year, it really, I, I, I find it unbelievable that people aren't more scared of this, especially Ethereans. It really is changing consensus mechanisms, really is like jumping from, from one airplane to another mid-air. Bitcoin did something very different on the ground. Satoshi made sure he had a very strong system. He could have chosen proof of stake. He was a very smart guy. He chose proof of work. Ethereum is being bogged down with high fees. And so, uh, and they also just cannot, cannot compete at the level of hash rate with Bitcoin. So they are deciding to move to a different consensus system. And they're doing this really mid air. And this is a protocol that currently secures $280 billion worth of value. This is one reason I, I like Bitcoin. I know something like this is never going to happen, that the consensus mechanism is never going to be changed because there is no centralized leader that pushes for these things. Ethereum simply does not have the same credible monetary history that Bitcoin does. They've changed their, their monetary policy uh, and their issuance uh, many times over history, whereas Bitcoin is very old and conservative and boring. But this is what you want for a new form of money. You don't want something that has been changed many, many times. As we said, Ethereum has just done one hard fork after another. This is another problem, of course, with Cardano, which has a centralized leader under Hoskinson as well. Asserting that you are decentralized or that you're moving towards decentralization does not mean that it will happen or that you are decentralized. And the very fact that Hoskinson can say we're moving towards decentralization shows that he's the brave leader, the brave centralized leader who really controls stuff because how else would he know uh, where things are moving? By contrast, Bitcoin's future monetary issu issuance, the number of uh, coins that are issued per block, it goes down, it's halved every four years. Everyone knows this issuance, issuance schedule and so they can plan for it. And there really is a hard cap as well, 21 million. One big problem, Ethereum is already so centralized, but proof of stake is inherently centralizing. The rich get richer since all you need to do is sit back and get paid. By contrast, under proof of work, Bitcoin miners really need to engage with capitalism. They need to fight to find the lowest for uh, the lowest cost form of energy. They need to innovate in terms of mining machines that are faster and use a less electricity. This is a highly competitive, highly industrialized field, as it should be. Proof of stake is basically just people who already have a lot of ETH. What is it, 32 ETH or something like that? And they just sit back and get to earn more ETH. This is too much like the billionaire fiat system. By contrast, proof of work, anyone can become a miner. And just because you've been a miner for the last 10 years doesn't mean your place is secured. You could be kicked out at any time. We saw what's happened to a lot of Bitcoin miners in China. Now, this is my take. This is my emperor has no clothes take on Bitcoin versus Ethereum. I wanted to be, bring up an example of a corporation that seems to agree with me, Atomic Finance, that was building... They're building various De DeFi applications on ETH. And then late last year, they woke up and said, what are we doing? We're literally building uh, on top of a Jenga tower in allusion to the, the kids' uh, uh, building, uh, building game where everything can collapse really easily. And so they moved from building DeFi on Ethereum to building DeFi on, uh, on Bitcoin, on the Bitcoin 
base layer. And what made them choose to do that? They chose it uh, simply to keep in line with their founding principles that sound money deserves sound financial infrastructure. Infura and AWS are not the infrastructure you want to have to rely on. And Atomic Finance uh, recognizes this. I'll link to this article so you can read the whole thing and read uh, their critique of Ethereum as well. But this is a company that literally pivoted and moved to Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin only. Now, DeFi is really cool. I had I made some videos about it earlier uh, this year or late last year and talked about MakerDAO, for example, and DAI and algorithmic stablecoins, etc. But the real problem is, again, it's built on a foundation of sand. It's built on Ethereum. And there's no guarantee that Ethereum will be around uh, in a few years from now or have its current form. Who knows how much it could be modified by then. So the coolest parts of DeFi, I want to suggest here, will be borrowed and built on Bitcoin, on the Bitcoin blockchain or on a Bitcoin sidechain. They'll be ported over. And so that cool new altcoin feature, token feature, DeFi feature that you're talking about, if it really is worth having, will eventually be absorbed by Bitcoin. There's another problem. If you build DeFi on a centralized system like ETH, even if it succeeds, which is not at all guaranteed, as we've been saying, a centralized, a new DeFi system built on a centralized platform will eventually be co-opted or captured by the existing system. Something that's centralized can easily be captured. This is what happened with the gold standard. All the gold was already sitting in government vaults and banks, so it's very easy to, uh, to confiscate gold from Americans and also to move away from the gold system. Once you own all the gold, you can decide to pivot. And the same thing is true for something like Ethereum. And I hate to say it, but really Vitalik strikes me as someone who'd be very very easily co-opted. He loves doing the uh, the current systems, talking points about environmental damage of Bitcoin, which he knows that is not true. Uh, so he's a liar in addition to everything else. He knows that proof of work is the most secure system and it does use a lot of energy, but that Bitcoin miners are incented to find the cheapest forms of energy, which always turn out to be environmentally friendly, like wind energy and solar energy. So he's he's someone who's not afraid of using the the current narrative and the current talking points of the current system. That just combined uh, with his his veganism and all this other stuff makes makes me really uh, not not want to uh, not want to trust him. Whereas we don't have the same problem with Satoshi. Was is Satoshi someone uh, like this? Well, no one knows. He's disappeared from the project and has been gone for many years. He set the thing in motion and then gave uh, gave this wonderful gift to humanity by stepping away and thus removing that central point of failure. And so you don't have the same problem uh, of a centralized figurehead who's regurgitating all the talking points of our current environment about how uh, Bitcoin is boiling the oceans and how meat is bad for you and other absurdities like this. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.